So your question about um, this idea of trying to engage parents and that um, school communities very much try to encourage that and to make sure that there is a diverse parent community that is involved. Um, and if there is a subculture um, that limits that participation, and I definitely think that is true. I think um, when I first came on um, to the school, um, they used to do a multicultural day and I was curious about it and then it got posted by the pack that it was something that they wanted to revive that it had um, it needed a bit more momentum behind it so I asked about it and I said you know I would just like to learn more what was done and um, what you're thinking about in the sense of reviving it and you know I had a very um, problematic discussion with the person that I was uh, met, that I had to meet with and um, arbitrarily um, when I asked so what happened what was the event like oh did you know that my landlord is Chinese and I and it puzzled me we were not talking about landlords or where people lived we were specifically talking about the multicultural event that happened at the school and so my response was, well, did your landlord participate in sponsoring it or? No, I just wanted you to know that my landlord was Chinese. I was like, okay. Um, and it was this um, real, uh, you know, I think in that very moment I realized um, that this idea of having a multicultural event was not going to be something that was going to be culturally safe for everyone to participate in if they were from a racialized community um, when as a person of South Asian ancestry notably um, I think that you know it's very apparent in my appearance and my name that things like oh my landlord is Chinese um, would be brought up and later on in that conversation I was asked if I know another parent who is of Japanese ancestry and I said oh I, I wouldn't know that person because unless they are a parent in my child's class um, because this is our first year here I wouldn't know that person oh but that person's Japanese don't you all kind of know each other and it puzzled me as to what the all meant um, I would assume that it would mean that we all know each other as parents in the school um, but there's 330 children I believe um, and there's got to be at least 200 families with multiple children so we wouldn't all know each other and then the idea that if you are from a racialized community you would all know each other uh, was exceptionally problematic so there is these um, clear messages and I think it's partly because um, we grow up in a society that is very dominated um, by white ideals, um, by the structures of um, who is considered belonging, who is not considered belonging. So whiteness is what is considered to be Canadian. That's who um, unquestionably is always um, sort of perceived to belong without any questions there's no like where did you come from when did you migrate here it is just assumed that that person is Canadian they belong here um, and then when you have racialized communities you have these weird messages oh well, don't you know each other um, or um, statements to prove that the person has some sort of connection to a racialized community by saying that they their uh, landlord is Chinese and you know, a while ago I read an article that was um, published later by um, later on she became my supervisor but uh, she wrote an article about how in health research um, we are looking at one of the social determinants of health is race and ethnicity and culture um, we look at that and we look at that to see how that is um, preventing people from actually gaining proper medical care, even in Canada, even in a universal healthcare system. And one of the things that came out of one of her projects was that, yes, we can try to do anti-oppressive um, work and we can try to interrogate racism, but yet we are in a system and a society that upholds that. And all our structures are built around that. 
Um, and I think recently I, I was listening to uh, indigenous scholars talking about this, um, that the bricks that are laid are um, based on colonization and that is based on white supremacy and also on racism. So then how do we undo this um, within our systems? And um, you know, part of it is, I think, first acknowledging that racism exists and it does, um, and it is a part of our structural problem. It's a part of our, the stru it's what structures our societies. And until we actually understand how that happens and acknowledge it um, and acknowledge our own um, sites that we might not be fully um, understanding of what our biases are. And I think all of us have biases. We all have privileges that we walk in the world and it's very hard to see them and to understand them. But until we decide that we're going to do that work and be reflexive, we, we're not going to get any farther. Um, and I think as our systems go, you know, when we have one person doing diversity in um, an organization that maybe has like a thousand members, um, or we have one diversity person in a health authority uh, to take care of I don't know, hundreds and thousands of patients and to make sure that they are um, culturally safe or that questions from healthcare staff are properly attended to or education is properly provided, um, that one person can't do it all. And um, so there is no value in that when we are only allocating one person and budgeting for one person, but yet the problem is so much bigger and um, it's, it's that band-aid solution. We're constantly putting band-aids on something. Um, you know, something bad happens. So then it gets um, exposed in the media. So then all of a sudden there's a little bit of money that goes towards that. But next funding cycle, that is cut out of the budget because we don't need it anymore. We are now anti-racist. We've got it covered. Um, and yet then we have another incident that pops up. And then we have, um, you know, all that repair work that needs to be done. But yet, if we had some sort of continuity of programming, um, ensuring that we are all evaluating our own biases and our privileges, and also making sure that we all walk around um, social justice, you know, walk around it, but walk inside of it, and also to act upon it. Um, I think that's part, part of the way that we will be able to move forward. But until that happens, until we have those acknowledgements that, you know, I don't think we're going to. And part of that is very much located in addressing, um, it's a personal work and it's a hard, hard journey. There is no uh, fast and easy route uh, to go through it. Um, you know, recently I was um, talking to someone about the caste system um, that was rooted in India um, and the Sikh community is one of the communities that are not supposed to have any, um, we're not supposed to put any weight in it. And, you know, um, my parents were really good about that. Like there wasn't that, much, we didn't discuss caste. Um, but part of that was because we didn't have to. We were not um, part of a lower caste system. We we're not part of the lower caste identities. Um, so we could actually just pass through you know, life um, in the middle here. Um, or some people think that it's, you know, closer to the top of privilege. Um, but it's very much true. It's not something that I had to contend with all the time. We had family friends, we had um, people that we loved dearly that had to contend with that issue all the time. And it was something that was brought to their attention when they were children. Um, and yet we could step in and we could defend and we could be good allies. Um, but we didn't talk about it, not at our dinner table. We didn't talk about how um, we had privilege and we were protected because of our privilege. And I think those are important discussions that we need to have and be reflective. And it just it made me uh, go and have this discussion, uh, sorry, discussion with my child um, and make sure that she's aware of that. You know, we had the system and um, it's a bit prehistoric and we don't believe in it. Um, but it is a system in which um, it oppresses particular people and creates vulnerabilities that are not of their making. It is a societal problem and um, how important it is that we make sure that that's not continued and perpetuated. 
and so you know and all age appropriate so not with these big giant words but you know I think for children they need to also hear that they need to hear that they have sites of privilege um, so they're there if they're in a teacher's classroom and um, they have an easier time with that teacher than another particular child so evaluating why that child is having a harder time and I know siblings who are of um, different ethnic ancestries and the sibling that is of European ancestry had a wonderful time with a particular teacher but then two years later when his sibling went through and um, this child is definitely perceived to be racialized had a very very challenging time and um, you know so when this at that time that child was grade nine he thought about it and said well why is my sister having such a crappy time when I had such a easy time with this teacher and I think it makes him think about his privilege as um, being white and when his sister isn't and all the other um, issues that she deals with on a daily basis and um, so until we have those conversations with our children I don't think we can actually seed um, anti-racism ideologies and beliefs 